Thanks again for uh, for joining us. So just welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm very honored to speak uh, with you today about this um, about this topic and and really uh, very thankful that World Potato Congress has invited me to to present. Um, we're all looking forward to the Congress taking place this summer. And uh, if you haven't looked into registration already, uh, please do so. It's a it's a fantastic event. Um, uh, I'll uh, just wait for some of the stragglers to join us, but uh, as said, um, uh, the World Potato Congress was on hiatus for a little bit because of COVID, but it looks like it should be good to go this, this summer, so we're all very excited to, to be able to meet again uh, in person, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, so the topic of my discussion today is um, it uh, basically pairs two exciting developments in the potato industry and uh, food production in general. Though seemingly dissimilar, uh, I hope to paint in the interconnections um, between the two. Uh, so forgive me, there's a lot of ground to cover. Um, uh, so, and there's some fairly involved topics. And um, so I'll probably gloss over quite a few things that need to be more, uh, need basically a presentation onto their own. Um, but uh, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get through this. Apparently small potatoes are not such a small topic. Um, but before I get into it, I'd like to thank obviously all the sponsors. Um, we've got our platinum level sustaining partners, our gold level sustaining partners, and also our uh, silver level sustaining partners. Uh, please feel free to give them a round of uh, virtual applause. Um, uh, so let me start uh, first, obviously, by introducing ourselves um, and our little potato story. Um, so my name is Joel Vanderskaff. I'm the general manager of Tuberosum Technologies. Uh, we're a potato breeding company based in Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, and we focus primarily on the development of potato varieties for the little potato market or creamers as we call them in North America. Uh, we have three different breeding programs across three different continents. And that culminates into what is the largest a little potato pre uh, program in the world. Um, and we work closely with the Little Potato Company. Um, actually, my sister Angela is the CEO. So yes, that we're that close. Um, and together we help commercialize uh, these little potato genetics in the North American market. Uh, currently, the Little Potato Company sells well over 150 million pounds of creamer potatoes and is one of the top fresh potato brands in North America. So little potatoes uh, may no longer be small potatoes. Um, I've got more bad jokes, but uh, thankfully everybody's on mute, so I can't hear any uh, disappointed groans. Um, so uh, together we have a goal, a common goal, and that's to make the potato the number one food crop in the world and to use that crop to feed the world better. But if we want more people to eat potatoes, we can't just focus on production efficiencies. Uh, we have to pay attention to what consumers want uh, because there's no point in growing food that people don't want to eat. Uh, so here are some consumer trends that um, we should pay attention to. Um, so the first one is less home cooking. Uh, and because time has become our most valuable commodity and people have less time to prepare a meal, it's gone from 40 minutes down to 14. Uh, so cooking time and convenience is a big driver. Um, consumers are focused on nutrition, uh, not empty calories. Um, Fresh whole foods in small sizes have become increasingly popular, as well as new and diverse offerings. And of course, food waste and low impacts on the environment are, of course, top of mind for many consumers. So little potatoes fulfill all those consumer needs. Um, and here's what they have to offer. So big taste. Uh, taste is not a recent trend. It's always been important to consumers. And that's why one of the primary attributes attributes we use for us uh, to select for, for as a selection criteria for variety development. Um, we also offer diverse varieties um, uh, with great nutrition and most importantly, uh, convenience and ease of uh, preparation. So the next step is to communicate this to consumers, which we do through the three E's. Um, first, we expose consumers to the product through the use of advertising, social media, food service, and retail and diverse product offerings. Um, 
And the next is to generate some excitement around it. And that can entail uh, the use of promotion, of course, uh, recipes, uh, highlighting new and delicious ways to use the product. Um, and then the last is to follow up with some education, bringing attention to the benefits of this product, that it's nutritious, environmentally friendly, and of course, convenient. So we have the product and the tools to bring the consumers on side. So we've got the demand side covered, um, but we still have the problem of the supply side, right? And effectively feeding the world. Well, it's a great start that we're already working with the most major, the most efficient major food crop uh, in the world. So great choice, everybody. Um, I, I can tell already if it wasn't obvious that uh, if you're joining us, you already have great taste. Um, so, but yeah, so working with potatoes, potatoes are already the third largest food crop in the world. Uh, but in terms of efficiency, uh, bringing, bringing more food with less land and water and resources, potatoes are by far the best compared to the other major grains. Um, and we're not just talking about edible calories where uh, potatoes bring quite a bit of nutrition as well. So how do small potatoes increase that efficiency? Well, first, as mentioned, smaller size uh, means less cooking time. And uh, less cooking time is, again, as I said, time is one of our most valuable resources. Um, it means a more efficient use of our limited time. So, and that's just, just a first world problem. Of course, uh, time is valuable everywhere, um, uh, but also cooking fuel is a substantial portion of uh, household expenses in developing countries. So less cooking time equals less cooking fuel equals less precious resources spent. Uh, second, uh, you don't need to peel small potatoes, uh, which means less prep time and less waste, and more of the product makes it from the field to the plate. Uh, in addition to this, most of the nutrition is in and around the peel of the potato, so leaving it intact actually means more nutrition also makes it to your plate. Um, now, uh, for our part, we've also been looking at uh, looking to increase the marketable yield through better genetics. Um, but in order to increase yield per plant without increasing potato size, we just need more tubers per plant. So more tubers per plant means your multiplication factor actually increases. So of course, when you are multiplying material over a few seasons, um, these increases uh, have an exponential effect and it takes less production cycles to produce the number of seed pieces needed for commercial production. So that carries into less years of multiplication. Uh, and less years of multiplication means less carried risk, a less chance of infection, and the proliferation of infection. You're not inoculating new fields with, with diseases. Um, uh, so essentially, you can uh, economically grow a commercial crop uh, using higher generation seed, which would, should provide better quality. So these are some of the hidden efficiencies found in little potatoes that contribute to, to feeding the world better. Uh, but of course, there is another technology that can significantly contribute as well. And that is true potato seed or TPS. So TPS has been getting quite a bit of interest in the potato research community of late. Um, so I'll try not to tread too much on the same ground that some of the other presentations have covered on this topic. Uh, again, I apologize I'm, if I'm going quickly over some fairly involved topics, but um, uh, for the sake of time, I'll just uh, do a, sort of a broad introduction to the, to the technology. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar with the uh, concept of TPS, uh, TPS is a, is a development that seeks to start the production cycle of potatoes, not from tubers or plantlets, but from the botanical seed found in the potato berries. Um, this has a major impact, major implications for nearly all facets of potato production. But so we already know that the potato is the most efficient food crop. What needs improving? Um, well, uh, unfortunately, there are quite a few constraints to current potato production. Um, it, uh, it isn't all that efficient to actually produce. Um, so one of the major constraints, obviously, is the non-availability and high cost of quality tuber seed. Um, just clonal multiplication year on year, the seed will degrade, your quality will go down. So you have to refresh it and get quality tuber seed in order to maintain your the health of the crop and your yields. Um, but in order to do that, you need expensive infrastructure to clean and maintain disease-free uh, tissue stock. 
Um, and then to generate those plantlets on a, on a commercial scale, it, it ends up working out to about a dollar a plantlet, um, sometimes a little bit less, but it's still a, a fairly expensive uh, starting material. And then because the starting material is uh, so expensive and it's, it's not, not very productive, um, uh, it takes up, up to eight years of multiplication uh, to make econ uh, production uh, economical. So that's a lot of carried risk. Um, and of course, every year you have the risk of infection, uh, the risk of crop loss due to extreme weather or disease or uh, any of these things. Um, and uh, so that's, a, again, as said, brings a lot of risk uh, to the production cycle. And of course, um, just growing them is only half the bottle. You still have to um, store them and uh, take care of them in storage. And that usually requires, you know, some fairly expensive storage with, you know, some optimized systems uh, to maintain, you know, uh, a bulky perishable seed tuber um, and storage is limited to, to a maximum of around nine to 12 months. Now, of course, it, as well, because you're dealing with a bulky and perishable uh, product, you know, expensive transport costs are, are uh, a, a limiting factor. And not only that, because it's grown in the soil and there's many soil borne diseases, uh, that means that there are limitations on seed export uh, due to, to uh, potential disease transfer, and there's all kinds of phytosanitary restrictions on, on potatoes. So these are some of the major constraints. So how does uh, TPS um, mitigate a lot of those constraints? Well, um, the, the main thing is going to be uh, reducing the cost of the, that initial planting material uh, when compared to plantlets. So, I mean, and that comes down to multiplication factor. Uh, essentially, um, uh, a potato plant can produce upwards of 5,000 seeds per plant. That's a huge jump for any crop. Um, that's, that's, that's terrific numbers. Uh, and when you compare that to one to 10 uh, for tubers or even less for plantlets, um, that's a huge jump in, in, in productivity. Um, uh, and TPS would be a viable replacement for plantlets as a starting material for production. Uh, significantly reduced cost, more robust planting material uh, as opposed to a fragile um, you know, plantlet. Um, and if you're looking at it as a replacement for tubers, 100 grams of true potato seed would replace three tons of seed. So um, just in terms of transport, um, and uh, reaching new markets, that's, that's a huge, huge um, um, improvement. Now also TPS transfers almost zero risk of infection of, uh, from major diseases and very limited risk for viruses uh, and which are easily controlled. Uh, so uh, this reduces expensive maintenance and testing um, and reliance on biosecure multiplication labs. And of course, um, it means that you are, you're, you're, you're more well assured that you have good quality starting material. And that's just built in because the mother, the mother potato plant is a good mother and takes care of her seeds. So yeah, uh, we're built some built in efficiencies in, in leveraging some built in efficiencies on the potato plant. Uh, and of course, because a single seed is tiny, it weighs less than a milligram, uh, and it could be stored for years, just like other botanical seeds, uh, storage and transport are negligible. So clearly it offers some major advantages. Um, so these advantages attracted us to this technology back in 2005. Um, we began a project with uh, uh, Dr. Mahesh Apadya, um, and then this blossomed into a full-fledged uh, breeding program uh, with a dedicated uh, breeding station uh, under the direction of Dr. Kai Altakur, uh, who developed some very promising material and a strong TPS platform. Um, uh, this work continues under uh, Dr. Neeraj Sharma and his team. So uh, I'll just get into a bit of the background. Uh, there are two main strategies for producing TPS varieties. Um, uh, basically, there's you're working with diploids or you're working with tetraploids. Um, each strategy is markedly different, um, and each have their strengths and their, of course, their challenges. Um, Tuberosum has explored both uh, strategies to develop PCS, but TPS. But our primary focus has been on the use of tetraploid material to develop commercially viable TPS varieties. Again, uh, I'll be in brief, I'll try to highlight the major differences between the two strategies with the knowledge that there's a lot more complexity to the story. And to date, there's been extensive work to mitigate many of these uh, challenges that are faced by each strategy. So um, in general, diploids uh, 
have two sets of chromosomes. Uh, that essentially means that they're, um, it's easier to control breeding outcomes uh, of the TPS populations. And typically the target is for high genetic uniformity. Um, once uh, sort of a genetic platform has been uh, developed, uh, it is e easier to pinpoint the traits you want to add and subtract. So this uh, especially comes into play with disease resistances. So if you want to introduce or bring in a disease resistance, it's much easier to do that with diploids as opposed to, to tetraploids. Uh, and current diploid uh, germplasm can be challenging. However, uh, current diploid uh, germplasm can be challenging to work with. Uh, it's uh, typically has poor vigor, yield, uh, dormancy concerns, commercial traits, um, TPSC production and viability, self-compatibility, in, in breeding depression. All of these have sort of uh, been uh, issues faced um, with, um, with, uh, with diploid material. Uh, now, tetraploids, on the other hand, have four sets of chromosomes, uh, which makes it much more difficult to control the breeding outcomes. And, um, and it's more difficult to add or subtract traits. Um, uh, tetraploids, however, typically have better vigor, uh, yields, uh, commercial attributes, uh, TPS seed viability, uh, and essentially all, all the potato varieties, uh, the majority of the potato varieties in the market currently uh, that are used for clonal pr production are uh, tetraploids. So that's sort of what we're, what we're used to. Um, uh, now, tetraploid parents uh, offer, and, and again, this is, this is one of the, 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 the issues or, or potential advantages of working with, uh, with tetraploids is um, because there's four chromosomes, it offers uh, genetic variation in the subsequent TPS population. Uh, so again, this poses some challenges, but it also presents some important advantages. So um, one of these advantages uh, is offered by the diversity in the population, uh, because diversity in the population seems to manifest itself um, in mitigation of disease spread and subsequent crop damage. Um, this has been observed to provide some resilience against diseases like late blight, which is uh, probably the, the, the major disease worldwide. So unlike genetic resistances or fungicides, um, which uh, sort of uh, are a, a sort of a target um, or sort of a strategy to you know, pr provide, uh, basically to close the door on Phytophthora, um, uh, in, in the past, these, these sort of strategies have been overcome by late blight's incredible adaptation mechanisms. Um, the genetic diversity found in a tetraploid uh, population see, appears to limit the infection and the spread. Um, so for example, the picture in this slide is an example of this effect um, that we observed at our research station during a season where late blight pressure was very high. Uh, the plot pictured was um, a direct seeded um, direct seeded tetraploid uh, TPS population um, and was adjacent to a clonal commercial uh, potato crop of a late blight susceptible variety. Uh, so late blight severely infected the commercial crop uh, and, and despite multiple fungicide sprays and the crop had to be top killed early um, to salvage the crop. Now our plot didn't receive these multiple sprays. Uh, instead, we just observed the infection. Um, and true to the ob observations found in other uh, other areas like uh, Tripura, where farmers where 90% of potato production is done with tetraploid TPS varieties, um, the farmers and ourselves observed that there, there's, there's small pockets of infection, but the pathogen did not spread throughout the crop like it would a susceptible uh, genetically uniform field. So the crop overall, as you can see in this picture, um, stayed healthy and green despite the late blight. Now, uh, this should come as no surprise um, um, because it fits with research findings in other crops that have employed genetic diversity as a strategy for disease mitigation and essentially healthier crops. Um, this research has formed the basis for uh, basically a new agricultural paradigm that incorporates a few interrelated strategies and models like evolutionary plant breeding, uh, which again, leverages diversity for crop resilience and sustainability. Um, of course, there's been agronomic research into the multi-line effect, which uses um, basically it's interplanting uh, different genotypes of the same species to help mitigate disease spread and damage. And of course, the ecology model, which looks at systems as a whole and how healthy ecosystems demonstrate a high degree of diversity and how plant and pathogen sort of co-evolve. 
So could diversity actually be a adaptation strategy? This is all in response to the limitations that we see with monocultures and uh, the cultivation and breeding st strategies that have led to a loss of diversity. So we've seen in many of our crops, we've seen you know, a, a fairly consistent and measured loss of diversity. And we've highlighted that as a, as, as a potential issue. Um, so uh, have we unknowingly you know, created an environment where pathogens can thrive? and perhaps um, relied too heavily on what is a powerful tool, but relied too heavily on uh, disease resistances and fungicides, uh, which can actually eventually be overcome. So um, are we, is there an end game to, to this strategy? Um, are we looking at facing the same problems that we see with antibiotics? Um, however, um, modern agriculture kind of relies on this model uh, because of the uniform product it generates. Um, too much variation is not commercially, uh, not as commercially viable and won't meet co current consumer expectations. But there is a middle ground. Um, practically, what we need is commercial uniformity, um, where the harvested product looks, cooks, and tastes the same. And this can be achieved while maintaining the power of genetic diversity. So tetraploid TPS fits this new paradigm uh, seamlessly, actually, um, because tetraploid parental lines naturally create a diverse population. And with strategic breeding, we can achieve commercial uniformity needed for modern agriculture. So I've shown two seemingly unrelated developments that can make potato production um, you know, a more sustainable uh, and efficient. Uh, and they seem in, uh, they don't seem interrelated, but there are actually uh, some interesting synergies between the two developments that can make each technology stronger. So these are the synergies between the two, and how TPS can help small potatoes. So uh, our creamers, the, the creamer market, help uh, commercialization of true potato seed. So TPS grown potatoes may require a longer season to grow to full size. So starting from a botanical seed may require a longer season. But if you're targeting smaller sizes, that also mitigates that problem because you, you require a shorter season. Tubers in a smaller size category demonstrate better uniformity uh, for shape, eye depth, skin finish. Uh, it seems that if a potato, it's going to show any sort of um, diversity or get uglier, it's gonna happen when it gets older and bigger, uh, which is fairly consistent with human beings as well. Um, uh, the advantages of higher seeding rates can be utilized without elevated seeding costs and compromising target uh, tuber size. So that means uh, typically with creamers, you will maybe have a higher uh, seed density. Uh, with cheaper seed, you can plant at a higher seed density. And because you're targeting smaller sizes, having that, uh, that density can keep the tubers small. So it, it works hand in glove. Um, and potato plants grown from TPS typically have a higher set due to hybrid vigor. So that first generation planted from the botanical seed can have a higher tuber set. Uh, this of course, you know, when you're also, when you're leveraging uh, higher setting genetics with this hybrid vigor, further bolsters the multiplication speed for subsequent plantings. So of course, this will hopefully reduce seed and multiplication costs and makes this category which is a category that can command a premium for convenience, it makes it more profitable. So these are some of the synergies of, of how it works together. Now, hopefully I've done a good job of describing the exciting promise of these concepts, uh, but now let's see how these concepts can look in reality. Um, so these are some of the uh, uh, TPS varieties that we've generated through TPS populations. All the potatoes in these uh, in the pictured were grown from tetraploid TPS. Uh, the, the one picture obviously uh, in the field is uh, single hills. So it demonstrates the, uh, the relatively high tuber set that you can get from uh, true potato seed. And then the lab picture with the group of, of potatoes, that's one potato taken from each uh, plant. So each one of those potatoes is genetically distinct, but provides the commercial uniformity. Um, so this uh, uniformity, um, so you can see the potential productivity and you can see the uh, commercial uniformity. 
Uh, this uniformity can further be enhanced, uh, uh, you know, through agronomic management and uh, technology like optical sorters. But even as is, as you can see in these pictures, without the sorting technology, um, the average consumer would have a difficult time telling the difference between this and a, and a clonally propagated crop. Uh, and of course, we haven't lost the advantages of uh, genetic diversity. So um, in conclusion, this presents a significant opportunity for a highly efficient potato production around the world. Uh, this, it fits perfectly within the new paradigm of in sustainable agriculture, you know, leveraging the, the strength in diversity, leveraging natural adaptation, uh, basically doing what the potato evolved to do. Um, and of course, we are well aligned with long-term consumer trends and growing markets. So this, uh, it seems like we've, we've been able to, to um, with this technology and this market, we, we'll be able to help feed the world. And uh, we feel it's like a key, key piece in making potatoes the, the number one food crop because we've uh, satisfied both the supply and the demand side um, aspect to that problem. And essentially we can ex uh, quickly expand potato production capacity uh, by making potato production more accessible to new growers. Um, Basically, they can start with botanical seed. They don't need all the expensive infrastructure needed to do clonal propagation. Um, it's, it's, it's basically making it easier for even smaller on small land holdings, you know, to be able to take a handful of seed up a mountain pass and plant their, uh, plant their field, as opposed to trying to lug a, you know, 100 pound sack of potatoes uh, to the same plot. Um, and basically, it so I said, it makes it more accessible to new growers around the world, uh, while it's also complementary to existing production models. So for Tuberosum, the, we, our path forward is we're currently registering um, uh, some TPS varieties in Canada, where, um, and we're scaling up production uh, for small commercial quantities of true seed of these varieties. Um, and then, of course, we're looking at local and international markets and stakeholders for early adoption of this new technology, uh, which we think can have a, a major impact on, on efficient food production and world for food security in the world. And we, we feel we're really well positioned um, with a solid genetic platform for both tetraploid TPS technology and the growing little potato market. So um, that's the end of my presentation. Again, I apologize if I went a little fast. Uh, there's of course lots more detail and lots more uh, interesting nuance to to this project and to this technology. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, uh, again, wanna thank everybody for, for joining me and uh, the World Potato Congress for allowing me to give this presentation. Um, if you have any questions, feel free. And uh, yeah, thank you. If you have any questions, you can go to the Q&A. Yeah, so... Um, the 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 costs. I mean, we've, there have been some basic costs. I, I can't get into a great deal. So, sorry, I'll just ask the, the the question first out loud in case you're not following on the Q and A. It's basically a, a, a basic question about costs. Um, uh, the the costs of are are sort of yet to be determined. Obviously, we we use the the current market as a as a starting point. Um, if we're looking at at sort of the the exact same generation, we'd look at you know the the basic cost of a plantlet, uh, plantlet, as said, is about a dollar piece. Uh, but keeping in mind that the same amount of labor that it uh, takes to generate one plantlet, right, uh, is the same amount of labor that it would take to cross pollinate. Uh, whereas where you're, you know, taking a cutting, that's one one plantlet. You basically made one to two. When you um, when you cross pollinate, you make three hundred. So um, we, we expect to see a, a massive reduction in, in cost. Um, 
In terms of uh, in terms of food fertilizer, uh, the agronomics is is again going to be a huge uh, source for um, for innovation, uh, and we're just on the ground floor, which is really exciting. Um, it's you know when we see the advantages of this technology, and we're just basically looking at it, at it it's in its basic form, and we haven't even looked leveraged fully leveraged you know things like priming technology. Um, seed priming technology uh, and and fertilizer uh, regimens, but uh, I, the the fertilizer I, I, it, it, from our from our experience is is not markedly different from from regular potato production. Obviously, some more care needs to be taken with the uh, with the botanical seed, especially if you're going to grow it under field conditions. Um, but uh, but yeah, it should be uh, there. There'll obviously be some some nuances, some uh, some changes, but uh, overall the fertilization should be fairly consistent with regular uh, potato production. So I've got another question: How does existing uh, variety registration system in North America handle TPS varieties? That's a very good question. Um, uh, we've been it's obviously an involved process. It's something that we've worked. Um, work together uh, with, um, you know, the uh, Variety Registration Office here in Canada. Uh, they were very amendable to this technology. They saw the promise of it and um, and saw that it was a burgeoning technology around the world and they had to figure out a, a way to respond to it. Um, yeah, so it's essentially a, a lot of the same metrics that you would have for other variety registration. Uh, I think if you're, uh, and it's just working with a botanical seed. And so if a botanical seeded vegetable crops, you know, have their own registration, um, even, even with, with tetraploids or other crops where you have some variation in the field, they have uh, methods for, for, uh, for accounting for that. Um, so uh, it's interesting. It's basically like you've got, you know, potato registration and then you've got other crop registration and they, some, they have to come together. Um, and so it's not reinventing the wheel. It's just, uh, finding the path that makes the most sense. Um, so in terms of uh, another, another question in terms of variety protection, um, variety protection in, uh, in Canada um, is, is, is very straightforward. Uh, essentially, uh, if the, the legisl legislation sort of uh, suggests that if your uh, parental lines are protected, uh, by virtue of that, your your subsequent populations are protected. So for in Canada, that's uh, it's very seamless, and I'm pretty sure that's uh, that's quite consistent with uh, with some other um, uh, with other uh, protection regimens around the world. Um, I've got a question. How far are you guys from commercialization? Um, well. Again, uh, I think we're just in the process of, of, of scaling up. Um, we're looking at building facilities uh, so that we can do scale up um, in a, you know, again, some of the, some of the um, things that we have to be accounting for is obviously, you know, uh, phytosanitary um, rules and, and regulations uh, around the world. Right, so you might have to make sure that your your production is uh, is producing high quality, disease free, uh, true potato seed. Um, so uh, so that is a bit of a moving target because um, um, many countries in the world have never really built a a, a system around uh, importing exporting uh, true potato seed, and even within Canada, uh, the, there's um, a path uh, identified for. Um, um, Seed certification within the within the within the tuber uh, area, but again, all of these things sort of have to be have to be uh, aligned, uh, obviously, with making sure that we uh, that we have high quality, disease free seed, but obviously making sure that we allow for you know uh, decent um, commercialization uh, and economics of of this uh, of this technology. So uh, some of it some of it is in our hands, some of it will be outside of our hands in terms of the commercialization. Um, but in terms of, you know, once the facilities are built in terms of uh, producing small quantities of commercial scale uh, true potato seed, with that multiplication factor, it's, it ends up being fairly easy. So um, I've got a question about what was the spacing you used for true potato seed? Again, the, the spacing depends on the type of, uh, uh, it's similar to tubers. Uh, right. Uh, it depends on the on the market that you're going for, whether you're trying to grow them big or small, um, 
or and what type of ride it what type of ride it is um uh, so typically, on, on average, we we kind of keep things just uh, at our research station around 12 inches. I wouldn't say that this is an optimized spacing, but it gives us a a, a good glimpse in ter in terms of you know productivity per plant and uh, and potential yields. But I mean the the option to to depending on seed cost to go very tight spacing is is always there, so you can increase your your tubers per acre. But again, the, the agronomics are going to be, uh, again, there's going to be huge uh, error. Huge room for exploration on optimization. As I said, I'm, I'm very excited about that area. There's lots and lots of potential. Um, uh, I've got a question about, um, I say that um, TPS transfers very limited risk for virus, which is easily controlled. Uh, does this mean you control virus in TPS by some sort of uh, treatment or say heat? actually know uh, how it's easily controlled is you would grow it in a, a, either in a controlled environment or uh, the, the easiest way to, to make sure that you've got disease-free seed is actually to, to test your parents. If the parents uh, don't have, um, have any of the viruses or viroids that can be spread to the, uh, to the seed, then you're assured that your seed is, is disease-free. So it's, it's very easy to test. It's, uh, the, the, the testing is quite inexpensive as well. So you would just test the parents, and if the parents are clean, then then you know that the the, the seeds are clean as well. Um, so the supplementary day, uh, the question is, uh, how many extra days are required with uh, TPS compared to tubers? Um, that's a good question. Um, that seems to be a a, a bit of a, a a moving target. So there's there's a couple things that come into play here. Um, one is um, uh, where we breed, we've got an, uh, a very short season and we've got also got very long days. So we've got two, you know, of the major stressors on, on potato production. So basically if, if, if it can grow in our season and bulk up in our season, it's, it's a, a, a very productive, um, um, or a, a quick bulking uh, variety. And so, uh, so a lot of our things would fit within, uh, current commercial standards of, uh, or, or current commercial growing windows around the world. Now, uh, we, do, we do start things in the greenhouse, but there's there's some flexibility that comes with true potato seed that most people don't recognize. Um, so for example, with, with true potato seed, unlike plantlets or tubers, um, it, ground temperature isn't as much of a factor. You would actually be able to seed uh, at, uh, at lower temperatures because um, the, the dormancy will only break once the once the soil conditions are right, um, and so it's similar to other crops. So you would actually be able to potentially seed earlier uh, than other crops, whereas other crops you're waiting for the ground to warm up to a certain temperature, waiting for everything to warm up, then seeding and starting your process. And of course, if you're looking at direct seeding, um, it, you know direct seeding you'd be able to go uh, exceedingly fast compared to planting with tubers. So you, the time that you lose um, in terms of allowing a small plant, uh, the, the, the seedling to grow compared to a tuber to grow might be offset by, by some of these advantages. But as said, um, it depends on the variety. Of course, you have long season and short season varieties. We typically breed short season varieties here. And we, in that one picture I, I showed earlier of the direct seeded TPS plot, uh, that was seeded in June in our season and was able to produce, you know, fair sized tubers. June is exceedingly late for planting in in um, in our in our area of the world. Uh, so it, we were we were shocked that we were able to see some some production in in that short a season. So, um, got a question. Uh, do I do we have TPS uh, program running in our Dutch breeding program uh, in the Netherlands? Um, uh, as mentioned, we have a breeding program with Fobec in the Netherlands. I know that is just a clonal uh, breeding program um, that is not for uh, for true potato seed. Um, so uh, I'll see if I can briefly explain. This is a bit of an involved question, but could I briefly uh, um, explain some of the agronomic challenges of germination, emergency, and early growth of TPS plantlets? Um, again, it's like like most botanical seed crops. Um, you have to you basically have to baby them at, in those in that in those in that first uh, little while until the the roots get developed. Be very similar to you know growing other botanical seed crops like 
like carrots and um, sugar beets. And uh, again, these are root based, but botanical seed based crops. Um, so I think, I think the agronomics would be quite similar to that. Uh, and some of the weed control strategies and um, those sorts of things. So again, uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but obviously we have to uh, tailor it to this crop. So um, those will be some of the challenges in terms of germination. There's no real, uh, the, the, from the varieties that we've generated, the, the germination is, is, is high. The, the quality and the, and the uh, vigor of the seed is, is very strong with, these, with the tetraploids we use. Um, is TPS disease-free enough, easy enough to test and be ex exported to the, to the EU? Uh, by the sounds of it, that's, that's the trajectory of things that, um, that, uh, that with, as long as some of these viruses and viroids are accounted for when producing the TPS, that uh, a lot of the phytosanitary restrictions uh, should be, should be quite, um, quite amendable to export. Uh, so I mentioned registration in Canada. However, uh, how does true seed product fit into seed potato certification system? Um, that's a very good question. Um, again, uh, that's still a work in progress with CFIA. Um, uh, they've uh, they've they basically identified a route for it. Essentially, it, uh, true seed would just be counted as, uh, and I'll just paraphrase, but the true seed would be uh, essentially nuclear stock. So it would have a nuclear stock certificate similar to uh, plantlets, and it would be just used as the, as the starting material. So you would maintain all the same um, uh, protocols after that if you wanted to maintain nuclear stock, but it would be, um, yeah, it would be uh, considered nuclear stock. And that's kind of how it would fit into the, uh, the potato seed certification system is, is the path that they've identified. Okay, uh, you have said that there is, isn't significant segregation of traits in um, the tetraploid cultivars that you are registering. Uh, have you had to inbreed the, the parents to give rise to these cultivars? If yes, how much selfing? Um, I, the, the techniques behind generating these, I, I, there, there's a lot of specifics there. I don't wanna really get into the specifics uh, too, too much, um, but uh, we don't rely hugely on inbreeding ourselves, that is a strategy to, 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 to develop um, tetraploid TPS, uh, but, um, but it's not something that we use overly too much. Uh, so I've got a question about whether there be uh, registering TPS in Europe. Uh, yes, I think there are uh, many parties working on this um, with with the with the various uh, you know regulating bodies in Europe. Um, I believe uh, one was already registered, and uh, uh, I think Bayo had registered Oliver. So I think there is is a pathway, but I think it's still a work in progress. But I, as said, uh, countries around the world are looking at this. It's it's a it's a brand new technology. Well, it's not a new technology. It's it's as old as the potato itself, obviously. But um, but in terms of growing and commercializing it, and it um, it's it's something brand new. So it's going to take some work to figure out how it's uh, how it's going to fit into the uh, the regulatory regimes. Uh, so I've got a question. Do you prime the seeds to get an earlier crop? Um, yes, that's obviously a, a possibility. Uh, breaking dormancy is, is going to be a key piece. Um, it's same, same with seed tubers. You want to break dormancy, otherwise you don't get the proper vigor. So that would be something that you would do with the, with the seeds. And of course, priming um, and pelletizing technology for seed crops is, is very well developed and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be able to tailor some recipes for true potato seed. Uh, could TPS ever be available for, for French fries? Uh, yes, uh, I believe so. I think it's just a matter of uh, time and research and attention. We, of course, uh, focus on the fresh market. That's, that's our main market. Um, it's, in many ways, it's a very challenging market because you have uh, the, uh, the, the consumer needs for visual uniformity are very high, uh, but uh, we feel like that's, 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 the, um, that's where we want to start. Uh, you don't seem to be too worried about seed transmitted diseases because TPS grown potato is a new system. 
I think we could see diseases like we have in tomato in the future. What's my opinion on this? Um, yeah, absolutely. There, there's always going to be diseases in viroids. Um, uh, and I think, as I said, if you can control for this or monitor it to make sure that your parents are disease free, um, then there's a great chance that, well, you're assured that your, your, your TPS population or your TPS is, um, is disease free. So that's, that's I think, fairly strong. Um, who knows what will happen? Obviously, you know, there's there with diseases, all, uh, all sorts of things come out of the woodwork. Uh, I think we've all experienced that over the last two years with Corona. So uh, who knows what the future will hold? I think in the long term, however, this uh, the strategy of using diversity um, as sort of a, uh, a way to mitigate disease damage is is something that has existed since potatoes existed. So it's 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 a very um, very strong and lasting systemic uh, resilience. So that's what I think is is exciting about that. Uh, do you meet obstacles passing DUS for variety registration in PVP? Uh, so far, no, no, no obstacles there. Um, that's in Canada. Uh, again, if we may encounter other obstacles uh, in, in other parts of the world. Uh, can you give an example of how much longer growing time you need compared to traditional baby potato production? Um, Oh, that's a good question. I would say, so just for example, we typically start our seedlings about two weeks prior in the greenhouse. Uh, so we do transplanting. I didn't really get into some of the agronomics. There's essentially three ways that you can plant true potato seed. You can plant it in a greenhouse and generate seedling tubers, uh, similar to what you what you do with uh, tissue culture plantlets. You can also uh, seed them into plug trays and then transplant those seeds into the field. Uh, transplanting technology is, of course, very well developed and it's is well utilized in many other crops. Uh, that's currently what we do on our, at our at our breeding station, and typically we seed the the, the seedlings, you know, two to three weeks prior to to, uh, to transplanting in the field. Um, um, yeah, and. Um, sometimes up to up to four weeks but I, again that's that's not not always necessary uh and that's usually yeah again um that's one of the flexibilities that you can have and then the last way you can do it is with uh, direct seeding and we have done direct seeding experiments on on our on our um station and was surprised to see how fast it, it went and again as I, as mentioned you would be able to direct seed earlier than you would be able to uh plant a tuber because you're not wor worried about soil temperatures uh, uh, how many generations of crosses are necessary to obtain such uniformity in tetraploid TPS families? Um, yeah, that I, I'm not sure if I can answer with great clarity. It, it really depends on, on, the, on the variety. Um, oh gosh, there's a lot of questions here, everybody. Uh, I hope you've got time for this. I do, but um, uh, do you see the first year of seed increase being done in a greenhouse rather than outside? Uh, yes, I, I do. Uh, I ultimately, if we can, if we can, um, you know, affirm that disease-free seed can can take place by testing the parents, um, I and you're in a low virus or viroid pressure area, it would be nice, and I think pro probably quite economical if you could um, if you could do it outside. Uh, I know in Tripura, uh, where as mentioned in my presentation, where they do, where 90% of potato production is, is done with uh, tetraploid TPS, the government actually does all their crossing and seed production outside. And, um, and so they, yeah, they don't seem to have, uh, have, have any issues and it and can be economical depending on, on your area. But, uh, but as said, um, um, it really depends on, on some of the regulations and certifications uh, or, needs that you need for, for certification in your area. Um, what percentage of germination do you see with TPS? Uh, yeah, very high, upwards of 90%, depending on the, on the cross. Uh, what is the breeding technique described? Uh, conventional uh, GE or GMO, it's conventional breeding. Um, yeah, the, we, don't, we don't currently use any genetic engineering or uh, GMO. How does the evenness of emergence and rate of growth with TPS compared to tuber seed? 
this has been an issue for us in the past with little tuber seed. Uh, usually, as long as the seed is 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 the dormancy is broken, the emergency and and your your seed bread preparation and your seed depth is is uniform and your watering is uniform. Uh, it sh it should be fairly uniform. Uh, again, it's it's a botanical crop similar to other uh, botanical crops, so um, too much variation in emergence would be would be an uh, would be an issue. So, but we don't that's that's not I wouldn't say that's a major issue for uh, uh, inherent in the technology at all. Uh, the tubers in the pictures appear remarkably uniform for TPS offspring. How come? Hard work. Lots of hard work and ingenuity. Uh, again, uh, we've been working with some brilliant uh, breeders. Um, uh, and uh, again, uh, Dr. Takur, who developed the varieties that you saw in, in those pictures, uh, has spent years uh, with this technology. Um, and uh, and he's, he's uh, yeah, a bit of an artist. So, yeah. How do you see TPS fitting in with current uh, potato certification schemes for vegetable crops, or do you see a separate scheme for TPS? Uh, yeah, I would say, again, it would be a hybrid, uh, no pun intended. Um, it would be a hybrid between sort of potato certification and and uh, and vegetable crops. And, and to be honest, it fits really well within the vegetable crops um, and could fit seamlessly in there. It all depends on your end use. If you're looking at multiplying it again, then I think it would fit within the, the potato seed certification. If you're using it as the, the starting source for your for your garden crop or for if you if the agronomics are figured out and people are using it for commercial scale, then I think it would just fit within the, the vegetable vegetable crops. Uh, weed control, small convention seed is generally more susceptible to herbicide damage, especially metribuzin. Uh, also, if TPS is slower to cover the ground, uh, is much less competitive against aggressive weeds. Um, so are you happy you have a decent herbicide regimen a grower can use? That's a very good question. Um, as I said, I think for direct seeding, um, I don't think that's the, maybe not the low hanging fruit. Um, there's a lot of agronomic uh, work that needs to be done. But as I said, uh, I do think it, I do think at some point in time, it is a possibility um, especially when you look at other, um, you know, direct seeded root crops like, like carrots and sugar beets. So it, again, it's a new technology, um, uh, time and, uh, creativity and innovation will, will, will help to unleash its potential in terms of how to do proper weed control. But again, we're not starting from scratch. We do have other crops that use the similar technology. Um, so we can just leverage that. Are you also thinking of taking the TPS diploid route route in the future? Um, yes, possibly. I mean, as as mentioned in my presentation, we have dabbled uh, in uh, in using diploids and diaploid inducers. We think there's some there's some promise to it. Um, but as I said, uh, you know, we're we're quite enamored with the with the um, with the 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 power of the diversity and how that fits within the uh, sort of a new agricultural paradigm. Um, so we're we're quite excited to to. To develop that, that area, we think there's a, a great fit for it, um, and we think in, in the long term it's it's a very sustainable option. So that's that's where our primary focus is. Um, we th we think that that's going to be part of the the solution in the future. Um, now, what do you consider as a small size, or when a potato is too big for you? Well, well, currently uh, the 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 top end size is 40 millimeter. Is uh, is Anything above that is no longer considered a creamer. Um, how long it takes from seeds to tuber harvest? Well, we're in a 90 day growing area. So like likely we would be looking at 90 to 100 days. Uh, doing research to deploy. Doing research to deploy hybrid TPS, we see a field setting. Uh, sometimes aphids visit our TPS plants before they visit the tuber grown relatives in neighboring fields. Uh, do you see similar events in your fields uh, or in our research? Um, we don't have uh, a ton of aphid pressure in our area. Um, so that's not a, that's not a um, an observation that we've seen on our uh, on our site. Have you done evaluations for adaptation under tropical environments? Um, as of yet, no, uh, not extensively. Um, the, the one uh, asset that we do have is uh, 
we're growing under a short season and long days. Uh, so uh, basically, those being the two major stressors in, in a lot of tropical conditions, they typically have shorter days and they have uh, sometimes longer seasons, depending where you are. So we, we feel fairly confident that the material that we're developing here um, should have uh, some, uh, actually may even perform better under, under those types of conditions. Uh, is a seed treatment required for fungal or insect control? Um, again, that would depend on your on your area. Again, the seed itself likely uh, the botanical seed itself likely wouldn't need that much uh, because it's, it's um, yeah, I, I wouldn't suggest that it would need uh, it would need much. But again, uh, the agronomics on that are still a work in progress. So um, we'll see. Maybe there's something that will come that will arise that will pose an issue and, and those sorts of solutions will be necessary. Uh, do these tubers suit aeroponic uh, methods? Uh, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, there's there's no reason why it wouldn't. Uh, yeah, um, I think I answered that question. Do you have more challenges with secondary growth using TPS compared to tuber grown materials? Uh, no, that's not that's not something that we see a great deal in our. Uh, in our, in our, with our material. Uh, looking at the shrinking potato growing window, especially in South Asian countries like India, how quickly can TPS be grown commercially? Again, it depends on your production methods. Um, again, the, we feel like the low, low hanging fruit is, uh, you know, generating seedling tubers or doing transplants. Um, and, and if that's the case, then basically your your starting material will be a tuber. So then your 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 window will be the the, the same as as others. It's would essentially just um, uh, make the the starting chain uh, faster and more effective because you'd be using a uh, the true seed, the TPS, as opposed to a plantlet. Um, so that would seem to be the 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 low hanging fruit for the introduction of this technology. Um, and uh, because that would require basically no modifications to any of the existing infrastructure or, or growing, growing needs. Um, if you're looking to direct seed it, you might need a little bit more time. But again, with, with priming and pelletizing and, and, uh, and being able to hopefully get into in season in a, an earlier window, um, uh, there may be some advantage that you might be able to still do production. And again, as I said, we grow under, we're, we're we're in a tight season ourselves here. So if it could be grown here, there's a good chance it can be grown in other, other regions. Uh, is there any difference in dormancy of tetraploid and diploid TPS? Uh, that I can't really say with any assurance. I mean, there's been lots of work on diploids. They've been working on, on things like dormancy. I know traditionally with actual, actual diploid tubers, Dormancy is is sometimes an issue, but that's not that's not a uh, that's not a hard rule. Uh, is uh, is night frost a potential risk for these type of TPS crops? Frost is a risk, no matter what. So yes, of course, yeah, that will be that will be a risk, uh, especially with a much more fragile plant. You that would be uh, maybe an even more elevated risk. Typically, tubers will have a little bit more. Um, energy reserve so if they do get hit with frost they can still keep growing with the with the seedling out in those conditions it would it would not uh it would not fare as well uh do you bring transplants or botanical seeds to the field uh currently on station we bring transplants but as i said there's three production models you can do either generate seedling tubers in a greenhouse and plant those seedling tubers uh, the next season you can do transplants or you can do direct seeding Again, I, I would suggest that the first one is probably the, the low hanging fruit, probably the most accessible and, and easiest to do. Um, and but transplanting technologies is, is of course very um, it's ubiquitous with other crops. It's very well developed, so I think that's uh, that's also a possibility too. Um, direct seeding that's that's the key piece that's going to require the most uh, most ergonomic work. I would suggest. Uh, do you have quality traits fixed or is the young physiological young age uh, giving a close range? Um, again, what we're targeting for is commercial uniformity in all aspects, right? So we want it to look, cook, and taste the same, but we obviously need it to grow 
similar to uh, with the, the farmer needs to be able to get a, a, a uniform crop. So that's something that we're targeting in our, in our breeding, and that's that's essentially you know part of our selection criteria. Okay, yeah, hopefully I answered all your questions. Uh, again, um, I'm sure there'll be more, but I again I really appreciate um, uh, all your all your questions. Oh, there's one more. How long can TBS be stored? Um, depending on your conditions, upwards of 10 years. Um, so yeah, there's lots of flexibility. And that that's something I didn't really highlight as much. That's um, that's actually a huge advantage, um, especially when you think about uh, you know being able to respond to the market. Uh, unfortunately, now with clonal production, you know you have tuber seed, and if if you have you know say if the market is soft and you are left over with tubers. You're forced with the idea of throwing it away or replanting it. Um, and uh, with true potato seed, you can basically react to the market. Um, so if you if the potato market doesn't look good, you don't have to plant at all. Um, but with tuber seed, you have to plant uh, either plant it or throw it away. Uh, with true potato seed, you can you can hold off till the market is is where you need it to be put the seed in the ground, grow a crop, and then there you go. So it's, it offers a significant flexibility and could con contribute to, you know, much less waste and being able to, you know, keep the markets a lot more consistent as well. Okay. Uh, one last question, I, I'll, and then I'll and then I'll stop it there. Um, uh, does the apparent uniformity uh, not also defeat the variability in terms of uh, you know the to as a resilience against uh, fungal and viral infection? Uh, no, it, it hasn't demonstrated that. Um, again, the 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 thing that we're leveraging too is uh, you know um, even with the inter uh, multi multi line effect. Typically, they're only planting four or five, you know, genetically uh, different uh, cultivars that are of the same species. Uh, with this, you know, every single one of those seeds in the field is genetically distinct. So even though they they obviously have quite a few genes in common in order for them to look and and act uniform, that genetic diversity does offer uh, a significant um, uh, a significant advantage. Now, of course. You know, uh, leveraging resistances and leveraging fungicides is, is they are powerful tools. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, these are things that we still want to to breed into our populations. But it's basically if we can compound that, uh, you know, um, enhance that as well with um, with these diverse populations, uh, I, we feel like that's going to be the most sustainable uh, path forward. But again, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. If there are any other questions, of course, um, you can feel free to contact the World Potato Congress or, or me directly. Um, but again, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, looking forward to, to the World Potato Congress in Ireland. And uh, again, uh, thanks again, everyone, for all your great questions and your attendance.